My Family Thinks I'm Crazy, a podcast where I, your host, try to give you some tips on how you can explain all this weird, wild, crazy conspiracy stuff to the people you love most, because that's what I've been trying to do for the past 10 years with no success. I've been telling everybody that our government is shady, but every time I do, my family thinks I'm crazy. The hollow earth, UFOs, aliens, and baby, pour it in the water, they spray our skies daily. When I talk about these things, they think I'm crazy. There's no escaping anymore, the evil that we're facing. Illuminati, my control, they're sacrificing babies. The end of days, but anyways, my family thinks I'm crazy. What, they don't want to listen to you? No, they don't want to listen. They don't want to hear it. They're just like, oh, here we go, Mark. <laughs> Off again <laughs> with your... Mark being Mark again. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so, you know, that's the thing about podcasts is when you're on the air, and it's like therapy, you know, if I can't talk to my family about this stuff, I'll talk to you, Matt, and all our listeners. Yeah, so who are we talking about today, Matt? Bermuda Triangle is one such earth ring that is the size of the Earth's inner core. You know, and there, there's there's multiple, I think there's 10 of those such wild vortexes that were just discovered by Mr. Sanderson. When you open a crack a rock open, you release a gnome of knowledge. You know, it's out of there. At one time, there were a lot of giants you know, roaming, the, roaming the Americas. Absolutely. We, we're the mobile megalith. We're the megaliths now. And we're the mobile megaliths. We go and ground energy and at these different places, and it's just uh, by, by grace, you know, we're brought there and, and put in these places. But that, that city lay is quite a, or the Acadian lay is, is quite an alignment to the listeners. It's, if you will, there's a straight line down the east coast of the United States from through a lot of cities Boston, New Haven. Bridgeport, down through New York City, Trenton, Philadelphia, Baltimore, Washington, D.C., Atlanta, Mobile, uh, Alabama, goes through the, the delta of, of uh, uh, Mississippi River and down to uh, Titoacan in Mexico City. So if we create coherent forms like that, that are in residence and geometric relationship with like a continental form like that, you have a micro macro conversation going on. If you can you know, establish the, these fields of peace, field, fields of, of uh, coherent energy. It, 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 that coherence just spreads across the land. And so, I wow. only had 40 million bucks. <laughs> <laughs> it's all part of this consciousness field. And, and it's one of, the, one of the, 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 the big consciousness fields that was contrary to the pyramidal form were the indigenous people and the indigenous people went around they honored these sacred sites and that, that maintained the world and with the indigenous people not honoring the sacred sites anymore with the sacred sites just being abandoned the earth is no longer hearing its voice which is our voice in prayer so the, the native consciousness of the circle and center needs to be brought back to the earth. And, and you know, it's, it's a missing p part of our collective consciousness. So it's good to see the uh, native peoples of America, of the Americas come, becoming empowered. And their, their, their voice is getting mod you know, getting out into the world and being part of the, part of it. You know, and it isn't no, you know, I mean, it's no longer just this kind of you know like iconic thing. You know, what native people are. You know, it's just like it's, it's a way of thinking. It's a way. You know, it's, it's a way your DNA vibrates. You know, they're they're the fourth root race, and it's and it's like it's a vital a vital piece of of the collective consciousness that's been missing. It's been suppressed.
Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the My Family Thinks I'm Crazy podcast. I'm your host, Mark Palmer, and on today's episode, we spoke with Peter Shampoo, a legendary author and researcher on a topic that's become near and dear to my heart. My girlfriend and I have spent many journeys traveling around our local area, taking a uh, a sense of the land, a lay of the land, if you will. And it was partly thanks to this excellent book I have in my hands here, Gaia Matrix. It's a, one of three books that our guest today, Peter Shampoo, authored. This book was largely inspired by the region that Peter and I both call home. Uh, Peter now lives in Arizona in a seven-pillared temple in the form of a 70 70- mile circle of sky island mountains and he was kind enough to broadcast from that beautiful sky island onto this amazing my family thinks i'm crazy podcast we talked about how we are all living mobile monoliths we talked about the true nature of the earth ley lines and the geomantic corridors that peter has spent over 50 years researching tracking and mapping out And he plans on putting it all together in a encyclopedia, an earth ring encyclopedia. I love the sound of that, and I would love to see that happen. He's got a lot of really, really awesome projects in the works, including rewatering the West. That's right. This seven pillared temple, 70 mile circle of Sky Island Mountains, when they are awoken with the proper energy, mountains are activated it will water the West. And we got into that today and more. It was an epic conversation with a really profound person. And I hope you enjoy and support this man. Obviously, you can find all of his work at geometryofplace.com. And you can also find his book on Google Play if you'd rather read a digital version of it. Uh, And like I said, towards the end of the interview, we posted all of the full color high quality pictures that peter sent us to the patreon so sign up to the patreon and you can check out all this cool stuff or go and see it from peter himself he's got a lot of amazing information on his website www.geometryofplace.com so without further ado folks enjoy this conversation with the great peter shampoo first how are you today well i'm i'm good a little nervous stage fright oh (laughs) don't be nervous we're just a small show yeah right i know but But, uh, you know you put out this information and you never know what's going to come back but uh yeah i'm okay i'm good i'm out in arizona yeah i read that in your email you you you're originally from massachusetts yeah out to arizona well, it seems like spirit just drags me around different places that I'm needed. And I came out here to help a friend get a spiritual center going three years ago. And I kind of got stuck. So didn't really understand why I was here until about three months ago. I, I really got tuned into the sacred landscape here. Finally, you know, everything finally clicked in and everything got integrated. And I find myself in the middle of one of the, one of the earth rings. That is, you'd call it the Sonora Desert Earth Ring. And where I am is pretty close to the center point of it all. And it creates a seven-pointed temple space out of multiple geologies that cohered into a ring over millennia. You know, how this works and why this, why these, why this phenomenon happens has been, been my quest to try to figure this all out. Yeah. So. Yeah, absolutely. And I love the way you describe the biomes and and even we as human beings and how our dance as it is, sort of like bees in a in a hive, collectively as we move, we create these ethereal patterns that really do have an overarching arcing effect on our 
world and our biome and and that can be tracked through dousing and and really i think through understanding what to look for so when did when did this all begin for you i know you're a stonemason by trade and and that's where you started to work with stone and understand stone but when you were a child i mean were you often exploring nature going to places that maybe you realize later on were sacred that's very true yes i guess it started when i was born you know, like born with a mission but my parents had a gi bill where they built their own house after the world war ii and they blasted for their foundation and all the rock that came out of the foundation hole was uh, full of dinosaur footprints so they they named me peter after the dinosaur uh, after the rock that came out of this hole in the ground but uh, from you know from day one I, I had this messaging that the earth is alive you know there are these dinosaur footprints embedded in stone so there was this idea of the living earth was uh, very present with me for, from from there on and my mother was a uh, big into having us out, outside all the time you know whatever you know, she don't come back until the street lights are on, you know, that type of thing. And, and I, I bordered a, a watershed of probably 50,000 acres that I got to explore as a kid. And I climbed a lot of mountains. Our family were avid mountain climbers around New England, you know, Mount Monadnock. Everybody's got to climb Mount Monadnock at least once in their life. You know, so, uh, yeah, it went on like that until I was uh, 18, and I was trying to figure out, you know, who am I, what am I doing? And I I took my name, you know, which translates into Rock of the Field. And so I said, well, maybe that's uh, an indication about what I should do with my life. (laughs) So I started to explore rock in the rocks in the field and found Stonehenge pretty pretty quickly, and, that, and then I got that got going on ley lines and reading the works of John Michelle, View Over Atlantis and City of Paradise. I believe that was the name of the book. But yeah, this type of thing. I'm sorry, I just have to make sure I got everything quiet here. Yeah, All right. take your time. Yeah. So. So yeah, that 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 continued. I chased ley, you know. I, I figured, well, if there are ley lines in England, there got to be ley lines in America too. So I chased that around New England. And I was into the New England Antiquities Research Association, which looked into these uh, monks' caves and such around New England. And, you know, from there, I, I just it kept expanding. And in '73, after working as a stonemason and doing a lot of sacred geometry for many years. Uh, I I decided to, well, you know, if there's geometry in flowers, if there's geometry within us, there must be geometry in in the earth itself. So I searched that out and found, uh, found indeed there was a triangulation of mountains in Mount Mansfield, Mount Washington, and Mount Escutney that created an equilateral triangle. And, you know, I was, well, okay, that's sacred geometry, any these simple polygons you find in nature are called sacred geometry because they come out of the creator matrix. So from there, yeah, I just kept uh, evolving and growing. At at every step of the way, I thought, oh, I'm done now. (laughs) And I never, I never got, I still haven't gotten done. You know, I've I've done the whole planet, kind of mapped the whole planet now with, with earth rings and, yeah, you even make connections to the planets themselves and how you can see the the planet's circumference and diameter within these Earth rings. Do these correspond to each continent, or are they only particular to certain continents? How does that map out? Well, the continental ring is the same size as the, the Earth's outer core. Okay. So, um, so the, 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 the Earth ring that is North America, which... You can see by the arc of California, Mexico, centered on New England, and that curves around and goes out into the Mid-Atlantic Rift and Iceland and all that, and down into Panama. So that that ring is the size of the outer core of the planet. And that's that same ring fits over Africa, fits over South America. So... But, but not Eurasia. Eurasia has more of a uh, polygonal type shape to it. Right. Yeah. 
a little bit bigger than that earth ring, but, but yeah, there's many, probably the most prominent earth ring dimension is that of the inner core. So it, it appears as though that there's this uh, visceral conversation uh, taking place between the inner core and the, uh, and the lithosphere. Like for instance, the uh, Bermuda Triangle is one such earth ring that is the size of the earth's inner core. You know, and there, there's, there's multiple, I think there's 10 of those such vile vortexes that were d- discovered by Mr. Sanderson. Ivan, Ivan T. Sanderson. And uh, there's another one that really got me going on this. Uh, when I was first introduced to this ring via Dorothy, Dorothy Leone, who, was, who traveled with her husband, who was a puddle jumping uh, male pilot around the West. And to pass the, the hours flying with them, she looked at aviation maps and found various magnetic anomalies. And she started to note them on the map and found that they were all in a circle. And those circles related to a lot of the sacred peaks of the West. They ended up with this ring that she called the 19 plus one. And that was, that was really the, that really got me going, inspired to see if I could find other rings other than, you know, if there's one, there's got to be more. So. Right. Well, yeah, we worked with that, and there's been a lot of people who've worked with that that particular ring. What is it about that ring? What, what is it about that ring in particular that stands out? Well, it's got Mount Shasta on it. It's got Mount Whitney on it. It's got Banff Lake Louise on it. And so it's it's the, the Arc of the Cascades uh, follows the, that 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 ring form. Uh, Sedona's on it, and at the center of it all is uh, the Grand Tetons, and and the Yellowstone Caldera. So every really every every one of these Earth rings has a has a, uh, a granite plug at the center of it, right? And, and and there tends to be this radiance that's associated with it, either radiance of culture, or nature, or, you know, confluence of rivers and such, right? Now, if we could go back maybe a little bit to the stone, because we mentioned in our email we're in Connecticut, so we we took a trip up to Shelburne Falls, inspired by your book, and, and we started in Derby, where you have the root chakra, then we have the, the sacral chakra up by People's State Forest, which we went to next, and then we went up to Shelburne Falls. But, you know, before this year for the most part podcasting served as a a way into this world and and i had interacted with certain stone sites like gungi womp or gungi womp in groton and there was something like a magnetic effect that once i visited that site whether it was through just sheer curiosity or something magnetically bringing me further I started to learn more and more and more about this site that, you know, yielding a couple search results on Google, you'll have a a, a slurry of different theories. You know, some people say, oh, it looks Celtic. Some people say the indigenous people to this place built it. And then others say, well, the colonial people built it as a root cellar. And since then, I've been really trying to answer these questions what is the true history of this place new england and i wonder if you think the the stones have some sort of magnetic effect in and of themselves that interacts with us on a conscious level yeah absolutely absolutely and working as a stonemason you you feel in your body every day you know if you're working with limestone it, or granite or, or a basalt or something, it has an effect on, it, on your body in, in, in ways that are very unique to that, that rock. But as a quarryman, I was called into, you know, there are a lot of these houses in New England that uh, were being built on marginal lands full of rocks. So they, they, they asked me to come in and build them a stone house out of the rocks that came out of the cellar hole, that, that type of thing. So splitting these rocks open, there's this, this charge that gets released whenever you, you, you crack a rock open. And, and uh, later on, I learned from uh, Dr. Steiner's work, Rudolf Steiner, that when you, when you open a crack a rock open, you release a gnome of knowledge. You know, it comes out of there. So I think that's, you know, cracking those rocks for 25 years, it, it, it 
it kind of imbued me with the knowledge of the planet. Yeah. And, well, like the, the earth was like, yeah, I think about this or, you know, kind of interacting with my own gaggle of giggling glia, you know, all that, all that nerve stuff in our bodies. Right. Right. But the gunny wamp in particular, those it's, very similar to all these other sites that are all over New England. These stone chambers associated with standing stones and stack stones. A lot of these stack stones are, you know, like three feet at the base and then like perfectly laid columns that go up to nine feet tall, you know. Right. <laughs> and but when I when I see something that's nine feet tall, <laughs> I I think of the forest people. You know. And, and the, the sites over in New York State, my memory's failing, a similar site to Gunnywamp, but over in New York State, over in the Hudson River Valley. Right. Is that near the Catskill Valleys? I think Len Kreisberg talks about it. Hunter Mountain and in that region, sort of near Woodstock there. Yeah, yeah, over that in that way. They, they had a, a lot of these chambers, and people were saying that they – were confronted with the forest people while they were, when they went there at night. And it's, it's my sense that this, this is what, this is where they lived. You know, it, it's like to, to move a lot of this rock, it, the, the height that it did and the size that they are, you would need to have a physique uh, similar to a Sasquatch. Wow. So that, that's my take on them. And, and so the, the, they, they had these little holes everywhere where they could escape to and hide. At one time, there were a lot of giants you know, roaming, the, roaming the Americas. Absolutely. Yeah. And, I mean, the mounds are, are very evident of that for sure. Yeah. So I, I think, you know, all, all this, you know, like all the mounds you find out in the Mississippian cultures of the Midwest, they all have a giant buried at the bottom of them. So it's my sense that these these Sasquatch are a remnant of this ancient uh, race of giants that used to live here, but they're they're kind of degenerate now because and they only come out at night because of the intense solar radiation that we have in the world right now. When 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 the giants lived here, when the megalithic culture was at its height, there was a much different electromagnetic field to the planet. It, it enabled mega flora and fauna to thrive. We're now, you know, it's just little hobbits like us who run around, you know, don't have a lot of skin exposure to, to radiation. But there was a pretty good paper back in the, in the 70s that, that was written about this, that there was a, um, a great flood that happened, <laughs> you know, that was chronicled by every indigenous culture around the planet that, you know, there, there was a huge flood that happened. And, and, and we, we see around the coastlines that th there's a submerged civilization too, under like 300 feet of water out on the, out on the uh, continental shelf. You'll, you'll find these the ancient cities there. There's one off of Georgia. There's uh, one off of uh, Panama or off of uh, Cuba. And there was one off of Japan and, Really, all over the, over the whole planet, there, there, there are these remnants. So there was that much water that fell. And the, the, the speculation in this article was that the, uh, there was an ice canopy that, that protected us and kept us, you know, protected the earth and kept it within a, uh, a certain mean temperature that allowed the, such flora and fauna to thrive within a radiation protected dome. So when that fell, you know, 40 days and 40 nights and, you know, waters came up from the deep because it, it changed everything about the planet and released all these water, the primary waters of the planet. So, you know, the Bible talks about the, the fountains of the deep coming up. And so I, I think when that happened, everything shifted. And all those Anunnaki and all those giant people and all those dinosaurs, just, you know, and all the megalithic culture, which were using the telluric energy that was uh, a lot more vital and vibrant as an as a agricultural support, if you will, to fertilize the lands and such. Some of the some big ley line in, in, in England where you, it's called the Michael Mary line. 
that kind of goes, uh, it follows the sun, May Beltane Sunrise Plain, if you will. It goes down through Avebury and Stonehenge and all that, down to Land's End. But if you follow that out, it goes to the historically mentioned position of Stonehenge, or uh, uh, the historically mentioned position of Atlantis by Plato. You know, he said, go out to the gates of Hercules and take a left, and that's where Atlantis is. And that's where the Azores are. So the Azores are the, the remnant of uh, what was once Atlantis. And that's right on the, that's right on the mid-Atlantic rift. So, and that's, that, that's a geologic zone that's being pulled apart. Uh, so if a continent were to subside and disappear, that would be a very likely place for it to do, do that uh, because of the tremendous tectonic movements there. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, like you pointed out the, you know, lost city that they found there in Cuba. I mean, theoretically you could see that line coming off the Yucatan and going all the way out to Puerto Rico. I mean, that could be the, you know, area through which these two cultures seemingly with so many similarities, Egypt and, and the Mesoamerican cultures and, and Central American cultures, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, you, you just laid out a huge theory for me. I have never heard, quite honestly, it put that way, Peter. And wow, thank you. Because so many people in this community talk about the firmament. They talk about the dome. They talk about the earth being flat. And I really, you know, based on all your work, I didn't even want to bring that question up, quite honestly, because I thought it was a little below all your work. I, I think you would have mentioned right off the top if you thought the earth was flat or not in your book. But it's so curious that this has been remembered from ancient times, this idea of an ice dome, and now it's it's sort of within this thought that the Earth is flat. Any thoughts on, on that model of, of the globe or, or flat plane? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I think it's round. I, I don't know. I assumed as much. Yeah, I'll just leave it at that. It's, it's round. Understood. It's the... Uh, you know, it's it's like the the rectilinear plane is is a kind of a mental construct, uh, a two dimensional mental construct, and and the, everything is a circle. You know, and, and if it's a circle, it's a sphere. You know, all all these all these the, the energetics of, of these rings are are you know I draw these lines on the ground, but they're actually domes. They're etheric domes. Of. And any really any medicine wheel that you put in any circle that you put on the ground, you're creating a dome as well. So so like well, like a sweat lodge for instance is is a is a dome and it's got rocks holding down the the, the tent and you know that's the medicine wheel. That's the model of the earth and and so that that you know it's the model of the universe really. So you have the celestial plane. And the Earth plane, and then then the terrestrial energies from below, and and you're working with all three there. And where we are, you know, it, it tend, you know, we, we get the sense of of a flat plane, and that's it's almost like a, the plane of the mind or something. It's uh, hmm. where I, I just heard a Hawaiian speak about this idea between the circle and the pyramid. And I, I thought about the same thing myself, that, that the peoples of uh, the equator are all about the circle, and the indigenous people are all about the circle. And, and then, then the northern climates, they're all about the pyramid. And, and you know, and that's like you need top-down, in, 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 in the northern climates, you need top-down organization in order to survive the winters. And so that was played upon with the Great Pyramid, putting that in, and it became, you know, the, the Great Pyramid became a kind of like a, a meme of, of consciousness where that, that all religions are based on, where, where you, you have a, a single deity at the top that everything gets filtered through, where an indigenous mind, there's they're just a mono you know, mono, you know, it's just like you and God. There's a direct relationship with God uh, within the circle. And, the, and the, within the circle, God is within. In the pyramid, God is above, over, you know, overlording and things of that nature. Yeah. 
Well, by returning to the circle, I, I think we retain our, regain our sovereignty. Uh, I would agree. I, I think to your point about the electromagnetic nature of our ancient planet facilitating this greater size of, of being, you know, what is there to be said about the origin of the stone structures within that time frame? You know, did that atmosphere create, you know, a more conducive methods for people to move such great weights of stone? Is that because, you know, now we're in this, you know, more toxified radiated planet, we don't have the ability to, to work with energy in the same ways. Let's see if I got the question. The, the megalithic culture and the, and the following kind of like the mimicry that went on, you know, there, there was an initial cultural matrix that was set up by Anunnaki, whoever, as a kind of control template. And as the knowledge, as we lost the knowledge, these sites were abandoned and the knowledge was lost because the knowledge was based on a, a different animal altogether with the earth. There was a, when, when those, when, when those, well, like 12,000, 25,000 years ago, uh, the earth had a magnetic field that was very coherent. And this is in the geologic record that like everything north of the equator was negative and south of the equator was positive. And, you know, there was a very clean line right at the equator of these two magnetic fields. And, and when, when, that, you know, when that highly charged magnetic field is fully alive, there, you, know, you can imagine, you know, there's quite a, quite a planet out there. And, and, and it had the, you know, you could use these ley lines. These ley lines probably actually could levitate stones because there was such a, a, a strong magnetic field within the planet body itself that using highly uh, paramagnetic rock, it, it, would, it would lend itself to moving heavy objects along these great lines. So when, when this collapsed, the culture that, that had created it couldn't, you know, they didn't have any raw material to work with. They didn't have this electromagnetic field to work with. And, you know, over, over this centuries, millennia, that, that field gets mixed up. You know, so right now we're, we're in a planetary field where we have nearly four different poles operating on the planet. You know, north and south and the mid-Atlantic anomaly and the, and the, or the South Atlantic anomaly and the, south, the Indian Ocean anomaly. So it's essentially we have four poles and we have this you know, tremendous mixture of uh, positive and negative energies that are kind of swirling around. There's nothing coherent about it. Wow. No. So, you know, eventually when that gets to a point where it just doesn't have the, the magnetic, you know, plus minus integrity, the the poles shift and when the poles shift that's when there's a renewal of the magnetic field and that that's shown in the mag that, that's shown in the geologic record that every time there's a pole shift the, the earth goes you know goes back to this this coherently charged planet again so that's what we're, we have looking. That's what we can look forward to maybe in our lifetimes. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. This is possibly this magnetic convergence that people say the Aztecs are predicting with their, with their calendar. Does that fit into what you just laid out? Yeah, there? yeah, yeah. Yeah, the cycles, the yugas, wow. all that. Now, when you mentioned the, the ley lines being sort of like an ancient highway of energy through which they could literally move stones, it, it kind of brings to mind 
again in the same vein of maybe highly speculative like the flat earth stuff uh, this whole new community of i will call them tartaria researchers maybe this is uh new to you or maybe you're familiar with this yeah. but there's a lot of theories that the railroads here in the united states were built on ley lines for that similar sort of purpose have you learned anything about that does that fit into anything you've researched yeah, yeah, it's, it's, you follow the lay of the land, you know, that's, you know, when you, when you put a railroad in, you follow the lay of the land to, to have the, 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 the least amount of effort to, you know, get to a place. And so that tends to be along the ley line. And so it's like Tartarians, I don't know if they, you know, it's them doing it. It's just, it's just uh, out of the course of nature. It's it's it happens when many highways follow follow these these ley lines. You know, so it's, we, so it's, we just had uh, lunch actually today along the city ley line. Uh, before we talked to you today, we went to Bridgeport, Connecticut, which in your book Gaia Matrix, it's laid out pretty clearly. Bridgeport's one of the cities along the city ley line. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I've changed the name to the, to the Acadian Lay because it goes through Nova Scotia and, and, and Louisiana, you know, where the Acadians from Nova Scotia were kicked up by the Brits, and they went they went down and became the Cajuns of Louisiana. So I, that is is particularly synchronistic for me because my grandparents are Acadian from New Brunswick, Canada, and my grandfather's first job was in Bridgeport along that Acadian ley line. So when he emigrated to Connecticut from Canada, he walked to Bridgeport and got a job. So it's, it's, that's, it's that's on a that personal level. Yeah, that, that's how this works. It's like we, we're the mobile megalith. We're the megaliths now. You know, we're the mobile megaliths. We go and ground energy and at these different places, and it's just uh, by, by grace, you know, we're brought there and, and put in these places. But that, that city lay is quite a, or the Acadian lay is, is quite an alignment to the listeners. It's, if you will, there's a straight line down the east coast of the United States from through a lot of cities, Boston, New Haven, Bridgeport, down through New York City, Trenton, Philadelphia, Baltimore, Washington, D.C., Atlanta, Mobile, uh, Alabama goes through the, the delta of, of uh, Mississippi River and down to uh, Teotihuacan in Mexico City. So that's that's the that's the root of that chakra, that 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 ley line that goes through the city cities. Wow. Well, the Skull and Bones Club is right, you know, in New Haven is right right there. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah, that's a big part of how I became aware of all this because when I was a student in New Haven at a community college. I spent more time in the park at that uh, green they have there, and I ran into a gentleman who moved to New Haven in protest to sort of pray in a very warrior-esque spiritual way for his ancestor, Geronimo, who you may know, his skull and bones were brought to their tomb there, their secret society, and he would pray every day in front of the tomb, scream Geronimo's name, and meeting him and learning some of the things he had to teach me, not only about skull and bones, but about Native American and culture in general, it, it really propelled me down this path. But I do find it curious, the whole history of Connecticut. I mean, more recent fact that I found really curious was John Winthrop Jr. being a alchemist himself. The first governor of colonial Connecticut was an alchemist. And and the whole process of taking you know the European culture and, and blending it with the culture that was already here, you know somebody who actually brought your work to my attention, a friend of mine, Michael Wan, he's been studying how this process of inversion in alchemy, the Rosicrucians took part in you know inverting the really like the the energy here, the telluric energy here, what you're studying and inverting it with their architecture and, and, and all that. It's it's quite evident when you see the arcs and how they pass through all these different places that, like you said, whether by coincidence or not, the energy seems to be drawing people to these places. And, and I think what some 
folks, myself included, are speculating is that these secret societies have a knowledge of the way this works and are building in particular areas for a reason. Would you agree with that? Oh, yeah, notion? absolutely. All that knowledge base that the, the Templars had were conveyed to both the Jesuits and and the, the, the Masons. So, you know, the Jesuits, they, they well, you know, they, they were having trouble with the Isle. I'll frame this with a story. They were having trouble with the Irish. You know? <laughs> I'm part Irish, I can understand. But they're having some trouble with the I- Irish because, you know, they, they converted the Irish. But whenever they got sick, they still, or whenever they needed something, you know, childbirthing or something was going on, they'd always go to the old, the old sites, the old sacred sites. So, you know, you know, that they were when the Catholics, the Catholic Church came to Ireland, they, they would put a church, you know, kind of at the corner of Maine and, and, and High Street, whatever, and you know, convenient to get to. But nobody would go to church. They would still go out to their sacred sites whenever they, they needed something. So so the Pope made a decree that all all churches were to be built upon sacred sites. So there was this idea of syncretism, one one religious form over another. So, you know, so they, they would name churches after Mary if it was a site of Bridget, uh, the, the, the goddess of fertility and stuff in, in Ireland. Right, right. That, I mean, hijacking, inverting, co-opting. Yeah, there's a lot yeah. Of so all the tricks and look all, at all, the, all the tools. George Washington had all the yeah. tools. He was a surveyor. And same with Jefferson. Jefferson's right on that same Acadian lay. I mean, right, right through his living room, pretty much there in Monticello. Right, right, right. And so, so Washington chose. You know, there was a debate of where to put the, the capital city. And so Washington chose this one spot in the middle of this malarial infested swamp <laughs> that they had to fill in in order to build this 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 thing. So, but that's where George wanted it, and it ended up being right on that 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 particular ley line. So he, you know, they they knew of that back then, and they called it the Satan's axis, because everything west of there was howling wilderness, and east of there was like civilization. So it was like a line of civilization along the coast there, and 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 he picked the seventy seventh parallel as well which is a master number, you know, so, so it's, it, it, it's like, that's a long, longitudinal, it's a movie, not a parallel, you know, longitudinal line of 77. Uh, and that goes right up through the, where the Iroquois Confederate had its central fire in Syracuse, New York, the Haudenosaunee. And that, and, and the line continues on up to where the, the peacemaker was born, who, who united the, the Iroquois tribes. So, and that's the Iroquois tribe was, their confederacy was what America was modeled after. So by, by using that 77th parallel, he, they drew the Tuluric line, the north-south line that, that fed the confederacy that now feeds the new American confederacy at, at this plane, at this angle. So there's also an angle there involved. So you have you know, the, the north-south line, and then you have the Acadian line coming in at an angle. Mm, what the, I have to look at that. <laughs> I, I, you know, so, so that angle w- would then have a geometry that would be implicit to it. And, and that's, how, that's how this all works, you know. Absolutely. One, one book that really set us off on this journey in particular was a book called Spirit in Stone by Glenn Kreisberg. And he has one chapter about the Hamanasset ley line. It's, it's sort of a short chapter and he doesn't really talk about it much further towards the latter half of the book. But it set us on this quest because it goes straight through Connecticut and up until that point unaware of your work we hadn't really realized that oh you know the potential that this this could be going on in our own backyards which naturally is really exciting you know we've set out on a couple journeys and found massive massive rocks we we encountered the Scaticoke reservation one of the last reservations on the western side of the Housatonic River in Connecticut we didn't you know, discover them. We just didn't know they were there. You know, it's personal discovery. And then, you know, talking about this stuff so much, 
we were recommended your work. And, and when we went to Shelburne Falls, what was so interesting was the only other place we had seen glacial potholes like that was in the Susquehanna River Valley with the person who recommended our book to you. So there was another synchronicity because now we're, we're you know brought to these glacial potholes on the side of the Susquehanna River right before, I think it's Three Mile Island, the place where there was that nuclear issue way before my birth. But yeah, we, we were just marveling at these glacial potholes and how strange they were. Has the Susquehanna River come up in your research at all? It's yeah, uh, yeah. allegedly one of the well, oldest rivers. Well, that 77th parallel, Meridian, is, 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 goes right through Three Mile Island. It goes through a lot of other places too, you know. When you follow it, it, it seems to have a lot to do with uh, with drugs, <laughs> like chocolate, rum, cocaine, tobacco, are all, are all products you find along the seventy seventh parallel. You know, different sites. I was going to ask what seventy seven means, but I guess that sums it up. Well, on a, on a geometric level, there's, you know, ge- when we're talking about gematria, there's quantity, but then there's also the qualities of numbers. So is there anything more to elaborate on that master number 77? Oh, well, it's an angelic number. Seven is the number of, you know, of divinity. And, and when you have two of them, it means that divinity into infinity. So it's, it's perpetuating. So it's... Uh, you know, there's kind of looking for the support of the creator energy and, the, and angelic energy to uh, to support the, the foundation of Western civilization. And that's that's really, you know, the Masons have gotten a bad name. But, you know, I'm sure they're, you know, they're power hungry people everywhere. Masons are not, but, you know, they're all businessmen and, you know, full of their greed and stuff. But and try to, but their, their interest was to create a, a civilization out of, Something that wasn't. So they used the, all their tools. You know, they, they were more likely to put a building on sacred sites than, than a church was here in America. So a lot of a lot of the sacred sites that, that are in America are, are, are open still. You know, they're not 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 syncretized with like a religious form, oh, like over in Europe or in South America. The Protestants were definitely not into putting their churches on sacred sites. They, they 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 named them around New England everything that's associated with the devil, like down down like Devil's Hop Yard, down by you guys in Adam. You know they they always called it the devil. You know if it was an Indian sacred site, they 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 named it Devil's Hop Yard or Devil's Tower or Devil's something. I'm sure you're aware of the Makamudis noises, right? The the devilish noises that happen from you know earthquakes deep. Have you looked into that any deeper than just the kind of stories you? Well, psycho mythological ceremonial work with Hobamok, yes. <laughs> you know the the sleeping giant that's uh, in your backyard there. Yeah, yeah. Can can you explain that a little further? Because we actually were, we might have hiked there today, but weather ha- had it uh, other plans for us, so we might go Friday, but. Please tell us more. Yeah, well, uh, Hobomok was a, you know, a creator destroyer being, you know, kind of like Kali or you know, Shiva or something, you know. It, it's, it, and, and the, the, you know, there wasn't, in the native worldview, good and bad happened. And it, it, all, it all came from source. So you just took what came and, well, he worked with it. And they called him Hovenbach. He was a great stone giant. And, and he was attributed with creating a lot of the forms around New England. And there's, you know, like the, there's a head out in the, there's an island in, off, off of Burlington, Vermont, in, in Lake Champlain. That's the head of Hovenbach. And, and the sleeping giant is the body of Hobomach. He was put to sleep by Kaitan in that form. Kaitan was a, a go- goddess of corn, and she came from the south, you know. And, uh, so as the glaciers retreated, this this deity came along with the corn that you were able to then grow in the northern, the northern climes uh, 
and, and, and Hobomock was, was put to sleep because he was causing too much trouble <laughs> going around, you know, like there up in the upper Connecticut river Valley, there's a place called uh, Sugarloaf and that's uh, and, and Pecumtuck mountain. And that's this body of a, a beaver with a broken neck and a head. And, and, and the broken neck is where Hobomock, you know, so clubbed the beaver and the beaver was going around eating humans and uh, creating all kinds of, you know, a huge beaver. Yeah. So there's, you know, a hundred stories, a thousand stories of Holmach all throughout the Algonquin tribes. And there are a number of sites for Holmach and they'd bring offerings there. So that's where you, from where, you know, in a native's perspective, that, that mountain, Sleeping Giant Mountain is, you know, like sacred, sacred space. And a sacred site. Right. Now, I find it curious that on uh, Sleeping Giant, there's a, just a sort of out of place castle. Have you looked into the castle that was built on? Yeah, Central yeah. Central I've Central climbed up to the top tower. and had a look at the view. Yeah, that was, you know, that was a civilian conservation corps project. They put putting the guys to work instead of having a communist revolution back in the 30s. Uh, you know. Okay. And so they, you know, nothing like crushing a rebellion with hard work, but, <laughs> but they, they, they built those towers all throughout the Connecticut Valley just for, you know, to get up there and have a view and take in the airs, get out of the, out of the smog of the cities. Right. Now to that point of the, the cities, you know, when you, you laid out the, and I thought you did a beautiful job of, of laying out how Bark Hampstead Reservoir acts as this, you know, sacral chakra. And it's really, you know, I'm not going to try to regurgitate what you wrote, but what you said about Hartford, I found really touching because I was a delivery guy for Amazon for a couple of years. And, and one of my routes was in all parts of Hartford from the, you know, from the mansions to the, the roughest neighborhoods and, and I really do have, you know, a, a strong sense of heart attached to that. But, you know, there's a lot of pain in that in that city. And what you said about the Barkham said reservoir and Hartford was really meaningful to me, just having that experience of, of being in Barkhamstead and seeing the just serenity that it is compared to any city, but Hartford in particular. It's it's such a huge juxtaposition rarely you'll lose service in connecticut and that's one of the places that you certainly lose service because it's just so remote yeah that's uh, that 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 line uh, that, that chakra lay is uh, it is a really important geologic structure and pilots that i've talked with who, who have flown that line have found that their 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 instruments are off when they when they fly up that that particular line so there's there's, there's a lot of energy flowing through there. The Shelburne Dome, which is a not just a single rock outcropping, but the, the largest part, part of the Shelburne Dome or the Shelburne Orogeny was uh, in Shelburne Falls. But there's, there's uh, a bunch of blobs of plutons that have moved their way up through the surface. And Bark Hampstead is, has one of those plutons there, similar to Shelburne Falls, and it goes all the way up into Vermont, up to like uh, Mount Scutney. So that that alignment there is is a, a demarcation between old and new North America. So w when you're on that line, you're kind of you know like you're bridging you know as a mobile megalith, you're you're bridging these energies. So everything e east of there are all granites. You know, the Quincy granites, or the granites, Stonington granites, New Hampshire granites. Those are all formed by the mid-Atlantic rift that used to be in New England that's now way out there in the middle of the ocean. So, you know, Africa and, and North America were together. So, uh, like, like you can find pieces of Africa in Roxbury. You know that 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 just really blew my mind when I when I learned that that you know like uh, you know all all the black folk that live in Roxbury in Boston are, are on Native African 
land, you know, and, 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 and the, the land is just so important to African people. I, I, I'd spoken spoken to a Nigerian and said, you know, I, would, would we ever have the amount of African people here if it weren't for slavery? And he, and he said, no way. Africans never want to leave Africa. You know, and if they do, they, they always, you know, create a, uh, you know, get a, get a graveyard or get a, get a gravesite back home, <laughs> you know, to be buried there at least, you know, if they had to, had to leave. But, you know, and another, another big blob of Africa is in Philadelphia. Really? Huh. Now, we might have been there this summer. Uh, we got a tour by someone I, I kind of mentioned, Ross Ben. He's an author. I really, I'll, I'll send you the links to his stuff. He's a really interesting guy, but he gave us a tour of Wissahickon Creek, which he described in the same way is old North America. And I don't think he had put it that it was Africa, but, you know, maybe he just kept that from us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's called Pudding Stone. It's a, it's, you find it in Rhode Island, too. Uh, and it's the same, the same rock that's in Morocco. Right. Is that the same rock that's in the New Haven East and West rock? I'm not sure if you're familiar. There's like red, they're red. I mean, is that? The pudding stone is like a, it's a, it's a sandstone that has a bunch of granite uh, rocks, you know, within its matrix. Okay. You know, and, and the sandstone, the middle field sandstone is, you know, just a, a sandstone deposit from the Jurassic, you know, Triassic, Triassic era. Wow. Now, back to Ross, he mentions in his book a journey by, I think, Abu Bakr II of a great, you know, African king who sailed off with, you know, 40,000 ships to the New World in the 800s and potentially settled what was, you know, became the Mayans and the Aztecs, potentially the origin of the Olmecs. Have you ran into anything with that? Uh, in mind uh, in your research or what are your thoughts on that line of thinking? I, I've, I've seen other people who've done some excellent work on that subject. Uh, but uh, I haven't, as far as the old mix go, I, you know, you say I'm, I'm a ring guy and, and I, I'm, I'm interested in, in the, in this, in, to the extent of their, their, their cultural location, uh, like ley lines and, and earth rings are defined by, a series of natural and cultural sites that cohere into either a circle or a line. Uh, a line on the landscape ends up being a great circle if you were to bring it all the way around the planet. Of course, you know, it ends up being a circle. But that, that, that culture and nature has to be part of that determining factor. And uh, the, the piece of that I can it just popped into my head. I guess I should say it. It, it, is that it, is that of limestone. You look around the planet where all the sacred sites are. You know, Egypt limestone, uh, south of France limestone, south of England limestone, Yucatan Peninsula limestone, Jerusalem limestone. It's like like we're all, all these all these cultural centers are were built upon limestone. Now is that because limestone's the easiest rock to work with, and you can make lime mortar? And, you know, find, find some Portland cement and, you know, you could create something, build something. Or is it the fact that the limestone has a lot of water that, that's sub underneath the ground that, that adds to the telluric energy? And that, so that, that's, that's the piece that really interests me is, 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 you know, what is this limestone business? And, you know, as, you know, humans being in the image and likeness of the planet, we are made up of, all this ganglia, you know, like our brain matter has, has ganglia, glial cells. So every, every neuron, every one neuron has nine attendant glial cells along with it. And glia operates on calcium ions. And, and, and so it's, an, it, it's, a, it's a frequency attenuator rather than a, so it, 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 it moves at the speed of frequency rather than the speed of light, which which our neurons do, you know, they're electrical. So the glia pick up on the electrical charge throughout our whole body. Every single glial cell knows what every other glial cell knows. 
the instant it knows it faster than the neurons know it. So uh, if you translate that into the planet, then limestone is the, is the ganglia of the planet. It's the most predominant, you know, that would be the predominant rock. You know, the most common rock on the planet is limestone. But uh, where granite is the, is that would, would be uh, comparable to a neuron. So you have uh, like a granite field in the middle of a, a, a limestone field. You have the same thing as, as a neuron cell. Yeah. yeah, so so if you create a sacred site on a limestone deposit, then you're inserting into planetary consciousness prayers or, the, you know, those frequency uh, attenuations of ceremony and such, and, and that gets broadcast through the planet immediately to all the limestone and all planet. You know, I mean, it's if it works like like our own bodies do. Mr. Shampoo, you mentioned a seven-pillared temple in the form of a 70-mile circle of Sky Island Mountains. Can you please tell us more about that? Yeah, yeah. The cl- there are these mountains down here called uh, Sky Islands, right? And uh, they're volcanic. And on the top of them, that they're on, on these volcanic uh, mountains, you have primary water coming up in the form of springs. So whenever there's a a volcano that comes up through the mantle, it brings some of that primary water that's that's locked inside the planet. We have four oceans of, of primary water underneath the surface of the of the planet, about 200 miles down. So as these these plumes come up, it creates these these conduits for water. There's water to come up to the surface. So you have all all these mountains with all these springs that created an environment up there that's like alpine. So the desert floor is desert, you know, and then you got these these sky islands. So in Cochise County here in southeast Arizona, we have uh, all these sky island mountains. And there's uh, five of them that are arrayed coherently into a, uh, a heptagon or a seven, seven pointed space. So it, it's like it's it's like a fingerprint of the creator on a planet. You know, whenever you see seven, that that's you know the angels, the choirs, the you know the, the chakras. The, you know, I mean, all this all the spirit stuff is associated with seven. And and the so we have five of those mountains, uh, and then so the, the the other two sites are just you know, thrown in uh, as uh, you know to complete the seven pillars. You know, and and there, there's a. Like a, the, 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 there's this mythological sacred space of seven, the seven pillared temple, you know, it's kind of, you know, in the, in the etheric that, you know, the alchemists have spoken of and the, you know, and all, all the Raja Krushans and, you know, all, all those guys, are, you know, in the, uh, yeah. Well, yeah. So we have that and uh, underneath it that- on the valley floor, we have, uh, Go ahead. Terry, you wanted to say something? I, I just wondered if that connected to the seven sisters, too, and the Pleiades. Which sisters? The seven sisters. Ah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Seven sisters, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. <laughs> I Anything to, to do with seven. Yeah. It has that resonance. Yeah. I listen to Pleiadian channelings off, often. And the most recent one, they mentioned how people such as yourself are doing this work to restore Earth's energy field. And did I get that right? Oh, oh no kidding. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. that's, that's, what, that's uh, precisely what we're trying to do here. Yeah. Because every time, every time there's a... Every time there's a, a pole shift that, that occurs, we have to, it's a restart. You know, you have to re- start from the beginning again. And if somehow we can, through our own spiritual power and magnetism, we can actually renew the field, is what my belief is. And, and we can renew the field by activating these, these earth rings around the planet. So this this one one particular one here is, if you will, is is down here. You know, this, I don't know. <laughs> but we have we have this array of sacred sites, 
that are based on the arc of the Mississippi River. And you have the, the Great Lakes, which is circular. You have the Finger Lakes, which is circular. You got the Black Hills ring. And then you got the Four Corner ring that's circular. And then down here, and, and they have the Sonora ring that's circular. And the Mississippi, oop, the Mississippi ring, that's the same circumference as the moon? <laughs> Yeah, that's, yeah, oh, yeah, you remember your, your book there, yeah, the moon rivers, many of the rivers on the planet are, are the same dimension as the moon, like like the well, the length of the Nile is the same as the diameter, you know, from, from, from delta to source is the same diameter as the moon, and the Mississippi River is, is the radius of the moon. What is, and. What's the significance there of the relationship between the moon and the, the rivers and the earth rings? <laughs> well, that's a whole book. In a nutshell, the moon governs water on the planet. So having the rivers are reflective of the moon's dimension and and, and they act as a as a conduit for lunar energy to, to, to come in and be part of planet body. You know, it's, it's, it's like, you know, every, every full moon, the moon goes within our magnetosphere and bounces back plasma onto the planet. So there's this increase of plasma that hits us every full, full moon. And the lunacy happens. All the, you know, all the things that, you know, everybody getting birthed and die and all this stuff happening all the full moons because all this, extra charge of plant plasma. So the, the, the rivers being the same dimension as the moon, they are in sympathetic resonance with the moon and are, will, are you know, take in that plasma and distribute it uh, through the waters. So where, where all these rivers dump into is on the 30th parallel. So you have the Colorado River emptying on the delta into the 30th. You have the Mississippi on the 30th parallel. You have uh, the Nile on the 30th parallel. You have the um, uh, Tigris Euphrates coming out on the 30th parallel. You have uh, the Yang Yang Tees River on the 30th parallel. And, and then, then you have the Ganges. Ganges is on the, it's, it's not its delta, but its source is on the 30th parallel. So that, that would suggest that there's, you know, a lot like a body, if you were in the living body, how is the earth a living body? And the 30th parallel would be, to me, is connected with the heart. So because all the blood goes to the heart, comes in, you know, comes in and out of the heart. So all, all this, the blood of the planets coming in and out of through, through this heart chakra it's on the 30th. Yeah, so, and then the solar plexus are... You know, there's a whole conversation with the 19.5 hot spots on the planet. The 19.5 degree uh, latitude, you know, the latitudes are frequential. You know, like each, each latitude has a different quality to it, and it's natural. The longitudes are all about time, you know, so it's the fourth dimension. So having having the longitude start in England at, is being primed by England. So time is primed by England. The, 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 the world view that England has and is projecting, you know, the, the, the parliamentary system, the monetary system, the Darwinian economic system, the language system, the, you know, everything, you know, it's all primed in that time, you know, right there in that zero meridian. I'm kind of, I'm advocating moving zero meridian to Tahiti, <laughs> where, you know, things are a little bit more mellow. But, so, so you have that going that way, but the, the up and down, you know, the, the latitudes, you got the equator. So the equator would be uh, like the chakra center, so, and, and then, then uh, the solar plexus would be the 19.5. And along the 19.5, you find uh, Mexico City, volcanoes, Benatibo, Philippines, volcano, Hawaii, volcano, big hotspot over Hawaii. You know, so you have all these hotspots, uh, you know, so that solar plexus, the sun, the, the radiance. And you find in the, in the sun itself, uh, we're... we're the 19.5 degree latitudes on the sun are, are similar. That's where all the sunspots and, and the coronal mass ejections come out of and all that stuff. You know, so that's its, its solar, that's its solar plexus. 
And so uh, each planet has its own solar plexus. Like Mars has a big, the the largest volcano in the the whole uh, solar system is on Mars, right on the 19.5 degree angle latitude. The the big spot on Jupiter, 19.5. So there's a consistency within solar system structure and planetary structure. And you kind of see how astrology works in that way, you know, because there's this resonant field that's uh, in conversation with each other. Right. This microcosm and macrocosm are quite evident when you really examine everything. One thing that, you know, as you're going through the chakras, I'm curious to touch on the third eye chakra and where exactly that is on the planet. Where do we see that represented? That's like a Stonehenge area. Right. Yeah. You know, throat chakra is around the 40, 40s, you know, 42nd, 44. You, you find a lot of, you know, civilizations are all, you know, on the, the empire. I call it the empire lay in Gaia matrix. And, you know, that's the 42nd parallel. Right. And the 44th parallel, you find, uh, uh, a lot of native communicators, you know, Lakota live on the 44th, you know, and they're, they're the communicators of, of uh, native spirituality now. And, you know, and the uh, the, the, the peacemaker of the Iroquois, he was, well, I shouldn't say his name, is on the 44th parallel as well. So that's kind of throat chakra. And so above that would be, you know, so you're, so you're getting up into those magnetic fields like uh, the 50th and 60th, you know, then you have the, the, the kind of crown of the magnetic ring around the North Pole up there with the crown chakra, you know, all that kind of, that, that, that crown energy that you feel when you tune into your crown chakra. It's, it's not like a, a little spot up there. It's just, you know, it's like, it's, you know, just like a crown coming off the top of your head. And uh, so the, the whole planet is, kind of mechanistic, almost like a clockwork with these earth rings. Right. And uh, if you get them all in, in the Americas, if we get them all activated and spinning, you know, it's a static spin, but they're all inter- interconnected and they, they all have these spin fields that, that interlock and, and, and reference one another. You know, you can see the, you can see a direction that the static spin is, is moving by, by looking at the landforms. So like in, with North America, you have that tail of, of Panama going into the body. So it suggests that it's spinning, looking at it, it's spinning clockwise. So that, that, that earth ring that is the North American plate goes up and touches the magnetic ring of the, of the earth. So if we can get North America spiritually just, just, you know, just really activated and alive will increase the, the charge, and that charge will help with the spin of the planet and stabilizing the planet through this change that we're, we're going into. And perhaps even, you know, uh, if we get enough people involved, uh, you know, actually re-enliven the, the magnetic field through, through these through these earth rings and ley lines. You know, that's what I'm into. You know I mean? It's, it, I, I'm into, you know, like applied geomancy. The real, I'm really tired of, just so tired of hearing, you know, ancient aliens, you know, praising these, these Anunnaki's who are just a bunch of a-holes. <laughs> we had to, you know, kick off the planet, you know? And it's, and it's like, you know, the more you dwell on the pyramid, the more empowered, you know, you get the pyramid. And the pyramid is not what we want as an energy on this planet. It, it was a control matrix placed there in the shape of a water molecule. I mean, that's 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 what the Great Pyramid is. It's a water, a solid water molecule that's interfacing with the biosphere. Wow! And you know, and you know, right on the Nile River, it's it's like it's everything about it is you know that uh, when when you look at the ley lines and there's there's ley lines you know that come off of the Great Pyramid off the edge forms, you know, energy comes into the side planes and are projected out the edge forms uh, of the pyramid. And you, you follow the, those lines and there's a great deal of, of genocide and destruction and, you know, like Armenia is on it. And, and Armenia and, and Fukushima are both on, on, a, on a ley line that comes off of the Great Pyramid. And uh, there's like an actual ring around the Great Pyramid from Armenia down to Darfur and you know, you find all these places of, you know, where millions of people were killed. And then, then, then you have, you know, the Baha'i Temple is right on one of the pyramid lays. And, and, and uh, Kaaba, 
you know, the, the Kaaba stone of Mecca right on a pyramid lay. Right. So it, it, it's, you know, all this stuff is just so, you know, it points to there being some very noxious energy being projected out through the pyramid. And for, for these TV personalities to be expounding about the, the wonders of in the Great Pyramid is lends more energy to that. You know, it, 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 it feeds that negative energy that's being projected out. out. And, you know, it's like that even if you have positive energy and putting it towards the Great Pyramid, those, those entities that, that control that, that place can take whatever energy is being put in and, and turn it into whatever energy they want to put out. And, and it's what's being projected is just some pretty nasty stuff. You know? So, you know, I, I'm into just, you know, like <laughs> fixing all this stuff, you know, yeah. like we, we have the knowledge base. We, we, you know, it's there and okay, you know, here, you know, and everybody's like focused on the control grid and, and, and I'm into the organic grid. You know, what, what is, what is the planet telling us? And, 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 and every, every action that this pyramidal culture has taken has, has, has done it to suppress the great circle the great circle of life, you know, I mean, look at the United States. I mean, it's just all these blocks, you know, <laughs> you know, Colorado and Wyoming, you know, it's like blocks of stone, like a pyramid. Right. And so it's this, this pyramidal worldview that we need to overcome and get out of. And in, in order to, uh, you know, save this planet. Wow. I love it. And I had never heard that apt description of the pyramid but it makes a lot of sense the way you lay it out and i'm i'm wondering you know i can definitely edit that part out because i respect the peacemaker i I think names should be sacred we might edit that name out that you dropped but you yourself described as a neo shaman and you kind of just hinted at that you know could you fill us in on some of your daily practices or anything you can recommend people do? I know dowsing is a big tool to understand where the energy actually is in your environment, but what other practices can you suggest that we and and the listeners do to help you bring this energy into the forefront, like you said, alive in this circle of life rather than the, the block pyramid? Yeah, well, it's, you know, I've been organizing uh, group events. I need collaborators, I need financing, but you know how I, you know, my, my relationship with the, with the earth is, is pretty loose and my shamanism is pretty loose. <laughs> I mean, I've never, I've never practiced or studied with any quote shaman, but you know, I come, come from a Sufic tradition where I use the prayers of Hazrat Nikon and my and, and the breath work of Hazrat Nikon, like the, the healing breath is, is one in particular that I find very helpful in, in getting centered and and being being right with the world. And with my, my own medicine wheel, I mean a lot of people say twelve or eight or six, you know, that should be a Merkaba, it should be this or that. Well what 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 I what I do is use a an enneagram, a, a nine pointed form which has a resonance with the Aeneads of Egypt, if you will. Uh, or, you know, like uh, many cultures uh, talk about these nine overlords that, that maintain the world. But the, the Enneagram, if you take the geometry, there, there's four polygons that you can make out of a, of a nine-pointed star. You know, you connect, you know, if you connect each one, one next to the other, you have the, 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 the lithosphere. If you connect the next two, you know, Next to one another, you have the uh, the mantles, the boundaries, and if you connect the next three, you you end up with the, the outer core of the planet. And then if you connect every fourth one, you end up with this elongated star that that frames the inner core of the planet. So, what that what that resembles is a kind of a quantum gravity field, and, and it, it's it's also found in the the great seal of, of, or the Aztec stone, the Aztec calendar stone, that has that same pattern to it. The ceiling of Dendera in Egypt has that same pattern to it. 
So what would I, you know, it's, it's the ring form pattern. So that's, that's where the earth rings come out. So when, when I do my, my work in the land, I always use a, in an, in an eogram, a, a nine point in the form to uh, communicate directly with the planet, to, to be in resident form with the planet. And uh, when, I, when I do well, like a large scale earth ring, if, I, if, if it has a, a coherent geometry about it, I'll put an, uh, one, one of these, like in, in the case of the Sky Island Pillars of Seven here in, in, in Arizona, I, I would put one of these earth rings, nine pointed earth rings on, on each one of these uh, Sky Island mountains. And when, when I put these in the ground, you, you need to put, if you put using rock, you need to put rock at least a third of its volume inside the earth. And otherwise, it, 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 you know, it just doesn't connect. So you need, to, you need to bury these things a little bit. And the size of the stone is not important, you know, like an agolith or, you know, something that's big. <laughs> but I, I always put gold underneath it underneath the stone as a, as a, as a conductive mineral, transmissive mineral. I, I, I picked up that piece from the Kogi of South America who held, uh, held on to the knowledge of for 500 years of the, you know, of the indigenous knowledge. And, and they, they said the gold wasn't, they, they, you know, the Inca had all this gold not to signify value and worth, but, it, it's a, it was a, a tool for spiritual connection. You know, like gold connects, connects the worlds, connects the inside of the earth to the celestial spheres. So by, by, by putting this gold in there, you, this frequency of gold, you, you, you just connect the, the planes and, and you, 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 you put it within a nine, nine, nine stone form and, and, and it's all in communication with all there is. You know that the the, the 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 orbits are are also in that same pattern. You know, like the size of the sun is the size of the inner core, if you will, and then it, it and then then it expands out to to Mars, and then there's this big this big kind of like distance, and then Jupiter and the outer planets do the same thing in relationship to the inner planets. You know, the inner planets become the inner core form, and the outer planets then become the the, the outer rings of, of this enneagram. So I, I, I use this in, in my work. I always bless the, the seven sacred directions because wherever we go, there we are, and, and we're in relationship to all there is. You know, like if, if I'm if I'm in the south of someone, I, I you know like, like you know, someone I, I'm providing the innocence, but they're providing the the, the wisdom. You know, so it, it's like wherever you are, you look at your relationship with the greater world through this perspective. And, and you just, you know, like with Google Earth, it's, it's quite easy to, to do this now. You know, you can, you know, well, there, there's my home. Let, let's look and see what's east-west of me. And everything that's out there east-west of you is, is impacting your life. Everything north and south of you is also impacting your life. And you're impacting it because you're, you're you're standing as as a you know as as the god within and 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 being of service to the planet in that in that relationship uh, you know so it's it's kind of fun to you know look at that you know and, and each each one of these ley lines there there's a there's a quality of of, of character that's displayed on and on, on, on what gets manifest on, on across the lay so that you know you got new york city you got you know yeah, a very similar kind of, you know, and they're all bays and they're all like estuaries and things that, that this, this line is on. And, but there's also at the base of it is this, you know, Aztec pyramid, which, you know, when, when uh, uh, Pizarro or whoever, Cortez or, you know, I can't remember which guy showed up there at first. They, they were in the middle of a 30,000 human sacrifice ritual. Like, you know, and then the temple was just covered with blood, you know. <laughs> so th- there's this, this thing of human sacrifice and, and you know, military industrial complex. And, you know, and, and this this line goes right over, goes between Dublin and London. You know, it's, it's like this line in the sand goes through Kosovo, you know, the killing fields of Kosovo and, and down into down and where, where Moloch was worshipped you know sacrificing the firstborn and all that business so that 
that frequent that that line, you know, is battle of the bulge, Waterloo. You know, I mean, all this stuff is, you know, all these wars, and it's just this entrainment of wars over and over and over again. And the more you entrain something with war, the more it attracts that same frequency. So to shift those th- those things around, we need to, you know, do uh, benevolent acts and acts of service and love along these lines in order to shift the, the frequency with, with 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 a contrary form that, that 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 entrains this this ley line to be you know outside that human sacrifice zone right wow yeah and with you know this conspiratorial mindset that we often have on a show like this you know you can't help but make the connection between a, a grand tragedy like 911 and again this ley line and and other ley line and energy Oh, and I wonder if, if again, not to put a nefarious blame or, or tinge on certain groups, but you wonder if these folks use that knowledge to create more of an impact and do a, a, a scenario like that in a specifically energetic place like New York City. They sure did. <laughs> yeah. The, the, the pathways that they that they showed that the, where the planes actually went uh, followed the ley lines that I know of. So, wow. I'm sure. You know, the one, the one that came out of Boston went right across the, the Mohawk Trail, the Route 2, right through Shelburne Falls, right over Shelburne Falls, and got to the Hudson River and then went down the Hudson River lay. So that was the First Nations lay. It went out, and then it went down the Hudson River lay, down right down hit hit 9-11, you know, and Right, and and those towers are right there on that on that Acadian lake. Yeah, you know, it just it just you know just like pounded pounded it into the consciousness of the you know that, that fear that you know just a, such a terrible thing they did to sacrifice all those people just just so they can go to war with Iraq. You know, it's a terrible thing. Right. I remember watching that. You know, it's like watching that on TV, and it was. We had actually just done a ceremony down in your your neighborhood on the tenth of September, in in an attempt to to procure some of the earth energies that were being sucked down to New York City. You know, because you know there are five lines that come into New York City to fuel its creative potential. If it didn't have those lays, it wouldn't exist there. So you know, it's a it's a sacred site, New York City. You know, it's got Cleopatra's needle and everything. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, it's it's a terrible thing. You know, that 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 human sacrifice that was that was that was a sacrifice to Moloch. Absolutely, yeah. We've heard similar things, not quite like that though, with these implications. And you know, to bring it back to where you're at right now, can you go a little further into what exactly might happen with the, with the sky islands and, and well, like yeah, the water is going to yeah. come from theoretically it's, underground, right? Yeah. I, you know, we, we were in the middle of a four year drought here and I, I did this, uh, I decided to put this nine, uh, and the, uh, a knee ad into the ground here at this uh, spiritual center. And uh, in the effort to get it to rain, to bring the monsoons back, I, I was starting to do this, these water blessings out in this, out in this knee ad. And I said, okay, I'm going to do it until it starts raining. So I did it for two days and this wasn't even rainy season yet. And then it rained, <laughs> you know, we got a good downpour. So that worked pretty good. So I started, and I started to throw more water and you know, draw out the geometries with water, and like throwing, you know, when, when you when you throw water, you know, like in a, in a in a cup with your arm, it creates a phi spiral because that's what your arm is. It's a phi, a phi, a phi spiral. So when you open it up, it it throws out. So I'm giving life, water, and all these types of things to, and, and then you know, so we have a we had a record breaking monsoon this year. Just uh, so I don't know, coincidence, but but it, it, it increased my confidence that that I could make it rain, and and the idea is to bring more rain to the west. The, the Colorado, you know, the, the the intention of this is to restore the waters of the Colorado Basin, and 
where we are positioned is right between the Gulf of California and the Gulf of Mexico. So we can draw waters from both those directions that, that then funnel it up into the Rockies, up into the high Rockies. So, you know, most of the, most of the big storms that they have up, up in the Rockies come, come from the South and, you know, kind of pulled up from the South. So, well, I can tell you for sure, we've got a lot of listeners of the show who are in California out west and some of the shows that i'm friends with would love to have you as a guest so i'm hoping we can crowdsource some funds your way peter and and make it rain out there i mean i'm friends with a couple farmers who they'd pay good money for that kind of thing you know sure yeah you know (laughs) getting a percentage from the power companies would be nice you know well yeah i mean you know i'm sure you know the whole story what's his name William Wilhelm Reich, you know, and how he was out there. I think it was him. He was out in LA and he got paid to make it yeah. rain or somebody did. And, and they ended up flooding Los Angeles. Well, that was, that was Benny LeBeau. Okay. Blue Thunder, Bravado. You know, he didn't use any of the Reich or Orgone devices, but there are people that have done that and use that and get, get spot rains. But, but what I, I collaborated with Benny on this, Benny's gone now. He's on the other side. He's like missing, you know, because he was the only other person in the world doing the stuff like I, I do. Wow. But uh, Benny, you know, so he, he asked me, you know, what about, you know, they were trying to get it to rain in Big Bear, Big Bear Lake because the, the trees were dying. The wells were going dry. The lakes were emptying. So he asked me to, you know, you know, uh, for an earth ring around that area, using that as a center. And so I, got, I came up with this eight, eight form octagon, 250 miles wide. He could only get to, you know, what Benny would do would, would go around and train people on a similar, on the same ceremony. They'd all be on the same page doing the same ceremony and the same songs and the same, you know, using the same crystals or something, you know, just as a, as a concordance of the group, but he could only find women to, to do the, do the actions. So he had, you know, these, these groups of eight women or eight, eight groups of women in this, in this ring. And the next day it rained and rained and rained and rained and rained for like six weeks straight. And there wasn't any rain expected. And he was publicized uh, when, he, when he came there. They was, oh, you know, rainmakers, Shoshone rainmakers coming to bring us rain. And, and, it, and it rained <laughs> the next day. And, and it caught everybody off guard so that the, the contractors, you know, had the roofs open and stuff, you know, and the houses were drenched. And, you know, so there was like from that from that six weeks of rain, there was uh, three billion dollars worth of damage and the three deaths that occurred because of the. So, you know, there's a big karma around around working this, you know, when you work these big rings. Yeah, it's. That, that's sad. I mean, to see the, those deaths happen, you know, and, and the, the, the problem was that we didn't qualify how much rain we wanted, <laughs> but boy, did it rain. Yeah. He, I remember Jay Leno was even joking on, on, the, on the tonight show uh, about, about rain. Oh, I don't know when's it going to stop, you know, but that was, that was proof in the pudding. Yeah. That was, that was something. The stuff really works. And uh, powerful and dangerous. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I've been protected to date. You know, I mean, this. I guess you know, as long as we, you know, I mean, it, it's like I haven't really been given a podium. You know, because the media, whatever powers that be, kind of probably see the potential. I was when I when I first got hit with when I first discovered the what I call the arc home geometry back in 93 you know that, that's uh, all of New England and you know and I, I just you know kind of crawled up in the corner and was crying and and laughing hysterically at the same time you know just with the responsibility of this knowledge and everything what am I supposed to do with it and what is it and what was it and I just heard this this voice in my set, head said archons And I, I said, "What's it?" And I didn't know what archons were at the time. And so it was. I thought, "Oh, I must have mis, mis, misheard it. it, it it's more uh, 
arc home, you know, like this kind of, you know, uh, arc, A-R-K, is the transmission of light through, transmission of knowledge through light. And ohm, you know, is, you know, ohm. So that was the whole idea behind arc home, you know, is what I, you know, in my, in my imaginarium. But it's, I, I think that, that New England is where the archons control the mental field of the planet from. I would, I would agree with that as someone who lives here. I would, and I know you probably have, I mean, Massachusetts is a whole nother animal, but I mean, we're not too far from New Haven. I worked a lot in within New Haven and, and there's a sure, certain yeah. intelligentsia that goes along with the Yale University and a certain status that people think they have or, or really do genuinely have. Yeah. And, and it's really, it's kind of obnoxious when you're just a, an average Joe, but when you start to really look into it, you realize that there is something more complex at work and, and yeah, it is archonic in nature. I mean, to hear you put it yeah. that way, it, it means a lot. I mean, I'm sure yeah. you spent many years thinking about this, so it doesn't come lightly from you. And uh, a bit of hope in all that is is that the the Buddhists are attracted to Shelburne Falls. There's there's all all sects of the Buddhist religion or practice are. Are represented there around Shelburne Falls, and, and you know, and, and then this is a beautiful array, right, right, clustered around the center of Shelburne Falls. So, so it's like this, you know, that Buddha Dharma is is seeding the North American continent with, with 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 prayer and practice and centeredness and peace. You know, you know so I think you'll appreciate this, and maybe you'll have something to expand. But when Tara and I went to Shelburne Falls. There was this overwhelming sense of consciousness there, like even to the point where, you know, her and I, we try to be very present in the moment, especially in public. So we were walking down the street and, you know, with the masks and everything going on, it's been really depressing and you're not used to people being friendly and warm. But there, not a lot of people wearing masks, but even the people that were wearing masks were very friendly and polite and out of out of nowhere twice we were struck up into a conversation with other couples who both times said we had to go to this bridge of flowers and you know i'm sure you've been there that you cross over this bridge this tiny little walking bridge and it's beautifully ornamented with flowers and even in the restaurant normally i would feel like apprehensive like someone's going to yell at me for not wearing a mask but I just felt this overwhelming sense of like, no, this is a place where people come together in peace and, 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 you know, the peacemaker and, and all that was in my mind. Yes. But at the same time, I felt it. Yeah, I really did. It was so tangible there. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a consciousness field that was set by the natives and it was honored by the colonials in a, in a treaty that for a day's travel from Shelburne Falls it is considered a place of peace. You know, you, you know, you can travel without being, you know, attacked by anybody. And, you know, and so if you translate that into today's vernacular, you know, you, you can leave Shelburne Falls in the morning and be in Japan in the afternoon. So, you know, a day's travel. So that, 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 that was, that was the whole idea around the Arco Millennium project that I tried to get to go get doing. And, uh, you know, the change of the millennium, and, you know, it was going to place these monoliths around new England and create this, this matrix of peace that would then expand and, and vibrate across the world and, and, and you know, bring together people. And, you know, it was, it was, it was a pretty complete art form that I, I developed could still happen, but yeah, you know, any, any of those types of things you can do is, uh, would, be, would benefit things. And, and I, 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 I firmly believe that installing this Arco Millennium, you know, monolith, which, you know, one, one of the stones would be done, put in Derby, Boston, New London, Derby, Poughkeepsie, you know, it, it's just in this, in this 120 mile ring. Uh, right. Can't you hurry the up there in the way as the axis right down the middle. Right. Right. 
So if we, if we you know, create co- coherent forms like that, that are in residence and geometric relationship with like a continental form like that, you have a micro macro conversation going on. And if you can, you know, establish the, these fields of peace, field, fields of, of uh, coherent energy, it, 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 that coherence just spreads across the land. And so wow. if I only had 40 million bucks. <laughs> oh man yeah peter i mean i hear you there it's certainly something to dream of i mean i'll tell you yeah. what i'll give you this tara and i instinctively we made a from what we've read in another book which you might be familiar with it's called the manitow and it's all about the new england stone structures they show you different types and one of them is called the spirit portal so when we were in the people state forest we kind of found this pile of stone and created a spirit portal there out of just sort of rubble looking stone that was in where I think someone had parked there and knocked these stones around and made them into a fireplace. So we repurposed it into a spirit portal in your honor, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. It's just, you know, those conscious and and co-creative relationship with the planet are are received, are, 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 are recognized and acknowledged, you know, the planet's alive, and she's really been suppressed and needs her help. She, she needs our help now. And, you know, I, I, I wish we could kind of repurpose some of this money going to the moon and spaceships and everything else to, you know, really, really work this planet. Right. And and get this this grid, you know. I mean, uh, I don't know. It's just, it's, it's, it's a real uphill battle because, you know, everybody wants, you know, I don't know. It's, it's all ego-based. You know, we, we, have, we have such an epidemic of narcissism now in our culture that it's really impossible to do anything collectively. You know, it's like, well, what's it do for me? And uh, what, is there a ley line going through my house? And, <laughs> and, 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 there, and then people get excited when there's a ley line through their house. And it's like, man, you, know, you don't want a ley line through your house, you know? <laughs> it's like, it's too much energy, you know? It's like, uh, you know. The Irish, the, if the Irish, you know, when they built their houses, they, they, if they built it on a ferry path, or in, they would have a front door and a back door and leave them open all the time so the ferries could go through. Not you a know, very it, convenient way to live your life with a no, <laughs> with no doors. Because no. <laughs> if, if there's blocks, if there, you know, if you create an energetic block and a ley line, you're, you know, <laughs> all those wars get backed up in your in your living room. Yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah, it brings to mind a lot of the more, you know, out there research, but I think really well thought out when you have this in mind of like how place factors into some of these strange deaths and and weird occurrences with celebrities and whatnot. I mean, the whole Kobe Bryant helicopter crash, they said that it lined up with the 40th parallel, which you mentioned, and, and also, you know, even down to the helicopter crashing in Calabasas, California, and, you know, Kobe was in a high school called Calabasas, right? So there's these strange uh, parallels, you know? Every life is like that. Everyone's life, you know, when you stop and look at it and think about it, it's like, oh, yeah, that's, you know, it's this this quantum soup that we're in, you know, whatever that is. And, you know, it's a field, you know, that we're we're all in, and, and, and we're, 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 we're a resonant form. We're a mobile megalith and we, we attract or we're, we're connected with these similar, similar energies. And, you know, and they keep popping up as memes, as, as these kind of like terms, words that show up constantly or, you know, places that it was in an attempt to try to make some kind of money off this, you know, cause selling books doesn't really do any good. I, I, I offered doing personal studies you know, of people who are trying to relocate or something. So, you know, you can't really get into their lives. You know, where did you live in your past? You know, there's a, there's a saying that uh, if you, if you put up, if you get a map and put a pin in every place that you've been, that there will be a portrait of you. And, and so you, you look at all these, these places and sometimes it ends up being very coherent and you know, specific geometry. And other times it's just like, <laughs> like a waveform or something, but it helps, it helps get, get a perspective on, on, on where you've been and where you're by doing that. 
So, I know someone uh, who may want to hire you for that <laughs> service because this one. Is well, well, yeah, it's it's. Uh, I don't really do it. You know, I've had a bunch of requests here in the past couple of months, and I just can't pull myself to do it because it, it, there's just so much emotional energy that go, goes. You know, and, and you're you kind of get into their lives right. and, and into their field, and it's it's kind of it's too distracting for me right now because I'm trying to get this bigger work underway before, you know, I mean, I'm pushing 70 now and, and, you know, it's like 20 years. It's like, oh, okay. You know, <laughs> can I get, get it done in 10 maybe, you know, <laughs> wow. uh, a, a good, good friend of mine and psychic uh, intuitive said that, that, that this is, this is a gift for the future. Because in the present time, and no, nobody really knows what what it's all about, or, or you know, like they, because of the discoherence of the magnetic field, it's creating this brain anomaly, you know, in us as well. So, you know, this this information might not be able to be processed and accepted by the modern mind. And it needs to be in the future mind after the shift, after this, after the great light comes. Right. Well, I'll say, I think from my perspective, as someone who just turned 27 years old, I think that, you know, with the response of just this small show, it, I try to have these discussions and bring up the topic of synchronicity and, and all these different things that I think are a part of the the homo luminescent evolution that we're going to, you know, from homo sapien to homo luminescent is how I've heard it uh, termed. And I, I think I've heard you describe it similarly, but you know, in that context, I think there's a lot of hope with my generation and, and younger. I think save for maybe the folks, unfortunately, who are getting into the new metaverse. I think a lot of people, thanks to podcasting are, are waking up to a more authentic reality that might not, bring them to all the right answers right away. But I think eventually they might figure it out. And, and ley lines is a big topic. I've had a lot of people reach out and say, you know, I love, I love that you, you talk about this. I've always been very curious and, and everybody says the same things about it. And as I've learned more and, and gotten into more of this, the details of, I found a lot of resonance with the, the small crowd that listens to the show. So I don't think your message is falling on deaf ears here, Peter. Yeah, good, good, good. Yeah, yeah. I feel it's it's interesting. I just got a got a hail from a, a message, personal message from from a librarian from Forbes Forbes Library in Northampton, which is this you know really old library, and, and it's where where I did a lot of my early research that 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 led to this whole body of work. So, you know, like I, I, I this. Your show, and, and I, I have two more shows lined up here in the next couple of weeks. You know, I mean, it, feel, it feels like things are finally you know, getting traction. You know, hearing, hearing from the beginning just yesterday and then, you know, being on with you guys, it's like it's, like it's, it's, it's part of the progress. It was, it was a sign that said, okay, you know, this is do this. This is good. Put it out say what you need to say. Don't be afraid to say, you know, stuff about the archons or whatever, you know, it's just, it's, it's time. Right. Time to get this, this, this out. I'm, I'm trying to get a encyclopedia done. Right. Right. You uh, mentioned that in encyclopedia that. of earth rings, you know, which is, you know, oh my gosh, I don't know, <laughs> you know, and analyze and describe each one of them and, and get, get that, get that, prepared for the future. I, I, I do believe that the, the earth is a cell, a living cell. And, and like a living cell, the consciousness of the cell, how it operates is all, is all within the capacity of the, uh, the membrane of the cell. So our consciousness field affects the planet. The way we think affects the planet. So, you know, the, the, the cell has these things called integral membrane proteins and, and, and they convey the information through the cell membrane into the nucleus and then, you know, and then from the nucleus out into the greater, you know, so there's this visceral communication between all the different cells through, through the membrane. And in our case, it's the lithosphere is the membrane of our Earth's cell. And if, if we get these 
messaging going on, you know, a lot like Shelburne Falls is a is a is a point of of entry into Earth's consciousness. So by doing ceremony there, by doing work, by having a lot of Buddhists around that 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 that, that center is is messaging the planet. So if we if we use these these Earth rings as as the way a cell uses integral membrane proteins, or in, in the case of the Earth, this integral membrane plutons. That's that's you know this visceral conversation is happening between the uh, the inner core and the outer limits. So uh, yeah, I love it. I love it. So and, that's and that, that's how it works. Me. It's it's so it's all part of this consciousness field, and yeah. and it's one of the one of the the the, the big consciousness fields that was contrary to the pyramidal form or the indigenous people. And the indigenous people went around, they honored these sacred sites and that, that maintained the world. And with the indigenous people not honoring the sacred sites anymore, with the sacred sites just being abandoned, the earth is no longer hearing its voice, which is our voice in prayer. So the native consciousness of the circle and center needs to be brought back to the earth. And, and you know, it's, it's a missing p- part of our collective consciousness. So it's good to see the uh, native peoples of America, of the Americas come, becoming empowered. Yeah. 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 And their, their, vo- their voice is getting mod- you know, getting out into the world and being part of the, part of it. You know, and it isn't, no, you know, I mean, it's no longer just this kind of, you know, like iconic thing, you know, what native people are, you know, it's, it's like, it's, it's a way of thinking. It's a way, you know, it's, it's a way your DNA vibrates, you know, they're, they're the fourth root race. And it's, and it's like, it's a vital, a vital piece of, of the collective consciousness that's been missing. Absolutely. that has been suppressed. So. Yeah. And this is, uh, goes into something I've been saying a lot lately. It's, you know, we are connected to the ancestors of the land in which we're born. You know, you know that all too well as someone who's studied the, the land so deeply. I mean, I think why the indigenous culture's knowledge resonates so much with me, you know, not only because I had a godfather who's Native American, not only because I've met a, a bunch of great people who happen to be Native Americans, but also because I think on an intrinsic level of just being born here, there is something connecting me to that body of, of people and, and language and, and understanding, you know, and race doesn't separate you from that. And, 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 and I think, you know, everything you said today has been so in concert with that. And I, I really hope that this reaches as many people as possible for that reason, you know, so that we can spread this message now when the earth quite literally needs it the most. <laughs> I love it. It's reminding me, though, you know, the talk of the lithosphere of one last question I want to ask you before we let you go. Crystals, okay? I've been fascinated by crystals since a very young age, and I started to realize when I was a teenager that they were gravitating me towards more intuitively or whatever it is, but I would just buy more and more crystals and find them and, and started looking for them and natural places and st- what is there to say about crystals as opposed to regular stone is there something inherently more special using crystals would you recommend using just any stone when you make a stone wheel or would making it out of quartz be better it's it's good to make a, a stone circle out of rock that isn't present where you are Not like so <clears throat> if you're if you're in a place where, you know, I mean, you can't carry some non-indigenous rock to that spot, you know, carrying a crystal creates a, a consciousness field. Silica is a consciousness field. So, you know, quartz crystal is particularly good for that. Granites are full of that, you know, silica. So, yeah, and, and you know, and those, if, if you work with those center points, like, uh, like the New Madrid Pluton, out in New Madrid, Tennessee, or the Shelburne Falls, Blue Town, placing, you know, using using crystal as a, a consciousness attenuator is, is very helpful because, it, you know, our consciousness, 
is based on the silica in our, in our own bodies. It's, it's able to resonate with things. And so, uh, you know, as mobile megaliths, having an extra crystal in your pocket is, is very beneficial. Right on. I have, I have been one to do that for many years now, and I feel like we're, we're very similar in many ways. Peter, this has been a pleasure speaking with you and, and learning so much. And, and, you know, I think hearing someone's voice really adds another component to reading their work. So I'm excited to dive back into the Gaia Matrix with you narrating it. And, and you know, let our listeners know where they can find you in your work. Obviously, you might not want them to buy the book through Amazon unless you, you care, you know, you don't mind. I mean, what's the best place for them to support you and follow up with the work you're going to be doing in the next few years and, and beyond? You know, I, I sell Gaia Matrix. I, I sell it myself. There's Peter Shampoo at uh, Gmail. You shoot me a line and send you off some books. Uh, there's also American Society of Dowsers, Danville, Vermont. They, they also carry my book, Gaia Matrix. Uh, the other two books are, are, are from Ingram, Ingram Spark, Ingram Press, and I'm having a little trouble with them right now. They, they stopped publishing my book because they didn't sign some kind of global agreement that kind of I missed. <laughs> so, so I've got to republish those books so I, before they're available again. There, you know, I, I have a limited amount of copies left in my possession that, you know, I could sell, you know, but until, until I, I mean, that's the only source right now. There, there are used ones available on Amazon. I saw one going for $10. You know, this is a uh, Arc of Ontario and Moon Rivers. And, and they go from anywhere from $10 to, uh, to uh, a 900 and I think $25 or something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What'd you get it for? 10 bucks? Yeah. She got a used copy of Moon Rivers for $10. So we appreciate yeah, that's that. That's cool. Sir. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's, right on. yeah. So, yeah. And my, my website is uh, geometryofplace.com. So you can, but you can just Google my name. There's just me and some of my cousins from, from Canada who are hockey players. Uh, <laughs> I'm there. So right uh, well, pretty easy to find on the web. Peter again. And, oh, and, and for people. those who don't want a paper copy and want to get, get, get it now, you can go to Google play. It's on that. Just, Search Google Play for Guy and Matrix, oh, okay. and you'll come up. With, get a digital copy. Get a digital copy. Very cool. Yeah, and we we do plan on putting the really nice high color pictures that you sent us on our site. You know, so people who listen to the show they can see some of the the visuals you described here. And uh, and yeah, Peter, this has been such a pleasure speaking yeah. with you. Like I said, you know, we've been really inspired by your book over the past few months. And I'd love to have you on again soon sometime. Thank you. It makes it all worthwhile. (laughs) You know, the next generation is going to be picking up the, picking up the stone and (laughs) building, building a new world. We can do it. We can do it. Yes. Right on to that. Well, folks, thank you for tuning in to another episode of the, my family thinks I'm crazy podcast. Enjoy the moment wherever you are in the now. Wow, what an excellent episode with Peter Shampoo. What a pleasure to speak with someone who's put so much valuable information in a book like The Gaia Matrix and The Moon River Book, both of which I own, and I hope you support Peter too. Please go to www.geometryofplace.com to follow up with everything Peter Shampoo. And like he said, you know, help him out, folks. He's trying to water the West. And I'm sure he can use our help doing that. And while you're at it, show us some love. Patreon.com slash MFTIC. There's a bunch of really awesome, high quality, full color photos that Peter sent us there that we uploaded. I hope you have a happy Thanksgiving. I think this episode's coming out either the day uh, of Thanksgiving or the day after Thanksgiving. So enjoy your holiday weekend with your family if you're in the States. And if you're listening in another country, we love you. We appreciate you. Thank you for listening to the show. If you're an expat and you're away from your family for Thanksgiving, we hope you have a good Thanksgiving wherever you are in the world. And if you just, uh, you know, are just from whichever country you're from and you don't celebrate Thanksgiving, I hope you enjoy whatever holiday comes up next for you. 
And for us, we will be bothering our family with conspiracy factoids and metaphysical um, soapbox rants. So I'm looking forward to posting some content on the Patreon that week when we are at our relative's place for Thanksgiving. It's going to be a fun time. So this obviously you might be able to tell by the way I'm talking about it was recorded a couple a week in advance. But either way, we appreciate you listening to the My Family Thinks I'm Crazy podcast wherever you are in the now. Thank you so much.